You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble, and Happy Halloween to all. Today, we're thrilled to present our original podcast, Hammer and Nails, in its entirety, here on YouTube. The show premiered on the HB Originals podcast on September 22nd, and aired weekly through to October 27th. Regarding Hammer and Nails, join podcaster Diane Woodrow in conversation with the renowned paranormal investigator Peter Van Melsen, as the pair discuss a strange case the latter was involved with, known as the Hammerton Horror. Over six episodes, you'll hear the recording of Woodrow's podcast in the quiet setting of Rosedale Chapel, interspersed with dramatic cutaways, designed to provide an audible glimpse of key events as they transpired. The show marks the end of the first volume of Peter Van Melsen stories. Stand by for the commencement of Volume 2 this December. As always, see the description below for chapter times and cast and crew info. And without further ado... Are we recording, Andy? Uh, yep, we are good to go. Great. Okay. Hello, everyone. You're listening to The Woodrow Show. This is your host, Diane Woodrow. Regular listeners will be familiar with the name Peter Van Melsen. As a leading authority in esoterica and the occult, Mr. Van Melsen has assisted numerous constabularies over the years with cases of a distinctly unconventional or supernatural nature. His meticulous methodology was recently brought to the attention of the general public following the extensive news coverage surrounding his investigation into the Hammerton Horror, a case involving several highly unusual deaths and a mysterious house on the Yorkshire coast. Do you mind if I smoke? Uh, be my guest. Thank you. Not a problem. Today on The Woodrow Show we'll be kicking off a six-episode limited series titled In Conversation with Peter Van Melsen, recorded here in the quiet village of Rosedale, deep in the Howardian Hills of North Yorkshire, in a setting close to Mr Van Melsen's heart, Rosedale Chapel. Mr Van Melsen, Woodrow Show listeners have expressed a great deal of interest in the Hammerton horror. Perhaps you can start by telling us how you came to be involved in the case. Certainly, my dear. And feel free to call me Diane. Of course. So long as you call me Peter. Deal. (laughs) Well, uh, my relationship with DCI, Mark Brent, goes back several years. For the benefit of those who may be unaware, Brent is the Detective Chief Inspector for North Yorkshire Police. I was first consulted with regards to that awful mesmerina business— I believe you gave the case some coverage at the time, Diane. For my sins, yeah. Well, as I say, Brent was no stranger to my work and methods, and so it came as no surprise that, following a particularly grisly and peculiar death atop Sutton Bank, the man came knocking at my door. I was invited to accompany him to the crime scene, and off we went. This was late September, I might add. It was rather strange. It seemed to me that autumn had been pushed aside in favour of an early winter. The sky was overcast, and it was bitterly cold. As the car ascended Sutton Bank, the only things that met my eyes from the comfort of the passenger seat were large, black clouds. (laughs) The damnable things were monstrous, and more so because I knew that somewhere beneath them, amongst the cotton grass and the heather, lay a body, a fresh victim of something outré, I ask you. 
Is there a place in this world more terrible than the bleak moorland of Britain's northeast? Well, I think some of our listeners might have something to say about that. That's a rhetorical question, mind. <clears throat> you were saying? I yes, the moors. Cold, barren places at the best of times. But that day in late September, the dusky skies overhead, my word, what a ghastly place to find oneself. We parked some fifty metres from the body in a lay-by, just off the A-170. Much to my chagrin, we were forced to wade through the bogs and the knee-high grass, all the while battered and bruised by terrible gales. I must say, the horror of the scene was established long before I laid my eyes upon that poor dead soul, and to lay my eyes upon him was unfortunately my purpose that dreadful day. Yes, Brent led me to the spot on which the body had been found. Then, surrounded by cameramen and a number of edgy officers, I approached the scene, and was afforded my first proper look at the prostrate form on the ground. The body was that of a young boy, his face pressed firmly downwards into a pool of brown water. His left arm was missing, as was his left foot. Cotton grass surrounded him, much of which had been crushed under the weight of something large, presumably his assailant. Well, I studied what remained of his upper arm minutely, and was soon convinced that the limb had been gnawed off by something with razor-sharp teeth. The foot, however, appeared to have been yanked off. The flesh that remained had a sort of stretched-out look. Imagine, if you will, a thick rubber band stretched to the limit. Just like that it was. I insisted that without flipping the body over, I wouldn't be able to provide any reasonable surmises as to the cause of the poor boy's fate. And so Brent cleared said action with the forensic analysts on hand, and the body was ever so carefully rolled onto its back. The moment my gaze fell upon the upturned face of that young boy, a cold chill travelled along the length of my spine, from the small of my back to the base of my neck. The boy was grinning. It was sickly sweet, that smile. His left eyeball was missing, I dare say, gouged out by the look of it. Nancy! Sorry. Sorry, Peter. Carry on. Yes, gouged out. But compared to that awful grin, the eye-gouging wasn't so disturbing. It sounds horrible. Horrible it was, my dear. Diane, my apologies. Please continue, Peter. You see, when assessing a case such as this, a crime involving the victim of something unknown, it's important to look at more than just the body. You must study the scene in its entirety, the overall picture. As I said, the cotton grass surrounding the body appeared to have been crushed quite uniformly, as though this thing, whatever it was, had fought with the boy— perhaps even struggled with the boy before putting him down. The boy's attacker had left nothing of itself on its body, other than the tooth marks on the upper arm, and perhaps a claw mark next to the eye socket. But nearby, possibly pulled out during the struggle, was a clump of coarse black hair, heavy with moisture, clinging to a patch of heather. I asked that Brent have it retrieved for further analysis, and returned my attention to the body. I was convinced that, under the objective eye of a microscope, further coarse hairs might be revealed about the boy's person. Brent assured me the fingernails would be thoroughly examined, as I felt certain that it was the boy who was responsible for this de-hearing. And then— as the oppressive clouds continued to gather overhead, I asked that Brent relate the details surrounding the discovery of the body. I can see it now, clear as day. I wonder if I can paint a picture for you, Diane. Be my guest. Trail runner called it in. 
You know the type, out on the moors, come rain or shine. Said the body was practically in his path. That if the lad hadn't been lying face down, he'd have tried to resuscitate him. Didn't even notice the missing limbs. Just pulled his phone out and dialed 999. Where is he now? Sent him home. Why'd you ask? No reason in particular. You think he can tell us something? Unlikely. You're sure this runner didn't interfere with the body? Sure as we can be. Sir? What is it, Davis? Uh, that clump of air has been bagged, sir. Oh, good. See that it doesn't go astray. Will do. Send frequency over, will you? Aye, aye. Frequency? Unusual name, I know. Officer Frequency was first on the scene. She might have something to add. Listen. What's with the grin? I'm sorry? The boy. Why on Heathcliff is he grinning like that? Sir, you asked for me? Yes. Van Melsen here is giving the place a once-over. Is there anything else you can tell us about the scene as you found it? Uh, not really, sir. The trail runner Mr Rogers led me to the body, and there it was, face down in the mud. Notice anything else in the vicinity? Animals, perhaps? Sir? Never mind, officer. Thank you. That'll be all frequency. Yes, sir. Damn it. Somebody get a tent over here, now! About that grin, Peter. Yeah, what about that grin? Well, at the time it was just a hunch, really. You see, several elements conspired to form an image in my mind. To begin with, there was the fact that the body was prostrate. That was to hide the grin. Even beasts get the heebie-jeebies, Diane. <laughs> but seriously, the main component of my mental picture was the clump of hair, which later, as I suspected, was found to match a number of coarse hairs found under the boy's fingernails. And so I concluded that whatever had happened to the boy had started with an encounter with what we refer to in the business as a wonder moth. A what? A wonder moth. Uh-huh. A wonder moth is, as the name suggests, a type of moth. Incredibly rare species. Easily manipulated. Manipulated? By what? <laughs> we'll come back to that. Let's just say for now that this thing was sent out into the world with a purpose. Only it wasn't behaving as its sender intended. More on that later. The following day, Brent came knocking at my door again, and informed me that the body belonged to one Grant Smith, a Hamilton boy of seventeen, missing for two days. The boy was last seen in the company of his friends, Patrick Jones and Richard Gordon, both of whom, we later learned, had some peculiar, if I may say, outre interests. But before my investigations led me to the door of Patrick Jones, I felt it necessary to pay another visit to Sutton Bank, in order that I might assess the scene a little more thoroughly, aided, as it were, by the clement weather that the beginning of October was providing. As you may or may not know, Diane, I don't drive a car. I've never really been interested in the things. Yes, I've been a passenger on more than one occasion, but I find the whole act of driving rather distracting. If I'm on a case, I take a bus or a train, an environment in which my attention and imagination remain uninhibited. From Rosedale, only a couple of buses pass in the direction of Sutton Bank each day, and so, on October 2nd, I think it was, I caught the very first, just after 9 a.m. As I journeyed through the villages of the hills, I contemplated the nature of the thing which might be responsible for taking the life of the youngster. You see, I'm approaching the middle of life, Diane. I've seen and investigated many strange and terrible things. I mentioned the Mesmerina case in passing, but even prior to that I had seen much, much worse than bodies nailed to train tracks and vagrants sacrificed in the name of the Batrachian Queen. Yeah, 
Well, the following may sound like a digression, but I assure you it's very closely connected to the case. A young lady came to my door once. Alice Hargreaves was her name. She looked tired, desperate. Her eyes were bloodshot, fingernails bitten to the quick. She told me that just a few days earlier, her daughter had been abducted from the backyard of her Hamilton home. She'd contacted the police, of course, and naturally they were doing everything in their power to find her. You know, asking questions, chasing down leads, narrowing the list of would-be suspects, etc., etc. But this was before the days of DCI Brent and his open-minded constabulary. The force responsible for this investigation had completely ignored one vital nugget of information provided by Miss Hargreaves. You see, Alice had witnessed the kidnapping. But this wasn't your average case of abduction. The thing that snatched the girl wasn't of humankind. It was a large, hairy beast, she said. Though it walked on two legs, it hadn't a face, had barely any discernible characteristics at all, only that it was vast, furry, and its face, if you can call it a face, was little more than a big, round mouth, bulging with huge, biting teeth, razor-sharp. It had wings, too, she said. But of course the police at that time didn't want to hear about monsters or the bogeyman. No, they discarded the young lady's comments and pursued a more traditional line of investigation. But, as you can imagine, I wasn't so eager to dismiss the lady's account. And so we returned to the subject of the wonder moth. You see, when I say that a wonder moth is easily manipulated, I mean it literally. Certain individuals, frail of body, strong of mind, have devised methods through which to command these things. Telepathically, you mean? Hmm. It's along those lines, yes. Let me give you an example. If a person of this sort, the frail of body, strong of mind sort, wishes to increase their prowess in a physical sense, then they may attempt to acquire the vitality of another. Like a vampire? Well, that's as good a description as any. Let's go with that for now. The Wonder Moth is a strange creature. It's small and fuzzy, as you might expect but the little blighter comes armed with a stinger about the abdomen. Commanded by our would-be vampire, it sent out into the world in search of vivacious victims. The younger, the better. Locating a suitable target, it stings. The injected venom establishes a sort of conduit between predator and prey. Through this conduit, the vampire exerts its will over the victim and reels them in like a fish on a line. Do you follow? But we were talking about a case of abduction, weren't we? Miss Hargreaves saw her daughter's kidnapper. Where do these moths come into it? Well, in the case of the missing girl, I suspected that something was amiss when Miss Hargreaves told me that both her and her daughter had been stung by something just prior to the girl's disappearance. You see, it isn't uncommon for one stung by a wonder moth to experience hallucinations. This, I believe, is an inconvenient side effect of the vampire's will acting on the creature. Furthermore, these apparitions are often said to be solid, tangible. So, let me get this straight. You're saying that the moth's sting resulted in the manifestation of something physically capable of abducting the girl? That's about straight, yes. Prior to her disappearance, the girl and her mother had been reading a picture book, entitled The Winged Furball of Wigan. Do you see? A quick sting from the wonder moth, and the winged furball of Wigan swooped down from the heavens to whisk the little one away. But how inconvenient for our would-be vampire, Diane. A mere apparition doing away with the vampire's prey. So the appearance of that thing wasn't a part of the vampire's plan? No, Diane. Like I said, an inconvenient side effect. All the vampire wants is to establish a conduit 
in order to lure its victims. These unfortunate hallucinations prevent that. Wow. Which, presumably, would be a good thing if the victims weren't carried off to be, well, I'm not sure I want to think about that too much. How do you deal with it? <laughs> with great difficulty, Diane. Oh, I did everything in my power to find that little girl, but all to no avail. I searched the rivers and the woods, the towns and the cities. I even paid a visit to the coast. Nothing. The police came up short, too. And so, you see, there had been a thorn in my mind long before that body was found at Sutton Bank. And as I rode the bus in the direction of that fateful spot on the moors, my mind's eye frantically searched my memory cells for anything that might help me solve the conundrum. I asked the driver to drop me at the lay-by where Brent and I had parked several nights earlier, and he did so, leaving me to my business on the edge of nowhere. I traversed the still boggy landscape until I neared the crime scene, which was still cordoned off. The sky overhead was clear, and the air was still, so I felt fairly confident that if there was anything still to uncover that had been overlooked, I'd find it under such conditions. I traipsed through the cotton grass, danced around the colourless heather, and carefully stepped over the police cordon. I studied the pool of water into which Smith's heavy head had been placed, and eyeballed the crushed grass in the immediate vicinity. And then it occurred to me, perhaps it was worth a little dip into that small, muddy pool, just a hand, mind. And into the cold water I sunk my mitt, clawing at the gelatinous mud just inches below the surface. Almost instantly, my blind groping yielded results. I clutched something square and hard. Out the thing came in a filthy fist. It was a plain tin box, just small enough to fit into the palm of my hand. I opened it, and much to my confusion, discovered a number of grey, round tablets. Certainly not medical grade, for these things appeared to be homemade, and they gave off a pungent odour, that of fertiliser or manure. I was absolutely certain that the tin had belonged to Smith, and suspected that that awful grin printed across his cold, dead face was somehow related to the fetid tablets the tin contained. And the beast of Sutton Bank, was it akin to the creature that kidnapped that little girl all those years earlier? I hoped not. Clutching the tin box, I returned to the lay-by, and stood in quiet contemplation, waiting for the bus that would take me back to Rosedale. Okay, sounds like a good point to take a quick break. Mm -hmm. Andy, can we pause for a sec? Yep. Is that okay with you, Peter? As long as there's a cup of tea in it. You've got it. Nance? Tea? Please, and a cup for Mr Van Melson too. No probs. Wonderful. I have to say, Peter, your account is compelling. I can't say I've ever heard anything quite like it. Such is the nature of esoterica, my dear. I beg your pardon, <laughs> Diane. <laughs> it's a breath of fresh air, Peter. The Hamilton horror case has really caught the imagination of our listeners. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Your tea, Mr Van Melson. Why, thank you. Thanks, Nance. You're welcome. Oh, marvellous. That's the good stuff right there. I'm thrilled. Andy, we'll get back to it now. Still rolling. Uh, ready when you are. So, Peter, you were waiting for the bus back to Rosedale? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, uh, I didn't have long to wait, fortunately, and spent the entire journey home pondering the curious tin box. I knew that eventually I'd be forced to turn it in to the police, but prior to that, I wanted to study it. Absorb its scent, as it were, in my library at home. I live on the edge of the village, in relative seclusion. I enjoy my privacy, Diane, particularly in these trying times. 
This is why I don't own a mobile phone. I simply refuse to be connected to an invisible system. It's like a prison, a vast network of cells, in which the guards are able to reach out and disturb one's peace of mind by simply pressing a button. A little Orwellian, I know, but I'm a man of simple pleasures, a man who operates at maximum efficiency only when his privacy is absolute. Now, back to the point at hand. I returned to my humble abode, and made my way directly to the library. I collected a number of choice volumes, first hallucinogens and culture, the illustrated encyclopedia of fruits, vegetables, and herbs, Chance's underground cookbook, and went on to my favourite spot by the window. The library overlooks a modest garden, a vista from which I draw a great deal of satisfaction, an elegant view that focuses the mind. And there I remained for several days, breaks for food and rest permitting, of course, studying the volumes at length. Hey. In my impatience to identify the components of the homemade pills, I rather crudely cut into one of them. Within, I found a sizable fragment of a leaf that, when compared to leaves in Chance's cookbook, seemed to bear resemblance to jimsonweed. Jimsonweed is known for its hallucinogenic qualities, and so, coupled with whatever else was in there, its presence suggested the notion that young Grant Smith had wandered out of his depth in some sort of delirium. But that only explained part of the mystery. The fact remained that the young boy was torn asunder by something solid, tangible, a corporeal creature. I knew that my next course of action would be to track down the friends of Smith, the pair he was last seen alive with, Patrick Jones and Richard Gordon. Assuredly, they'd have something to say on the subject of his disappearance, and what it was exactly the trio were up to. Did you have any ideas at that stage? Well, over the course of those days in the library, I read cover to cover a dozen books, most of which centred around botany, and specifically hallucinogens. But also— my wandering eyes happened upon a passage in Fisher's Dreams and Visions, which suggested another possible use for jimsonweed, when combined with other herbs and who knows what's. Can you mute that, Andy? Done. Sorry about that, Peter. We've reached our time limit for episode one. Understood. Let's take a break, and we'll resume recording in ten minutes or so. Yes. Is that enough time to set up episode two, Andy? Oh, yeah, plenty. Great. Just give me a moment to record the outro. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today, folks. You've been listening to The Woodrow Show with your host, Diane Woodrow. Today's guest has been the renowned paranormal investigator, Peter Van Melsen. Our conversation regarding the Hamilton horror will continue next Thursday at 8pm. In the meantime, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments section. Until next time. Andy? All good. OK, Peter, let's take ten. Although, I have to admit, I can't wait to hear more. Oh, there's a lot more to tell, Diane, believe me. OK, Diane, and we are rolling. OK. Hello, you're listening to The Woodrow Show. This is your host, Diane Woodrow. Today, we'll be continuing our conversation with renowned paranormal investigator Peter Van Melsen as he recounts his involvement in the Hamilton Horror, <clears throat> the widely publicised case concerning the deaths of several youngsters and a haunted house on the Yorkshire coast. Mm -hmm. Once again, we're recording in the quiet seclusion of Rosedale Chapel, enclosed by colourful stained-glass windows. Tell me, Peter, hmm. what is it that attracts you to this place? Well, Diane, it may come as a surprise to you to learn that the chapel was originally built as a place for lepers to worship. Really? Indeed. 
Back then, the fit and the healthy didn't consider it proper to worship alongside lepers. Better to secret them away somewhere. You get my point. Sometimes, when sitting here alone in silent contemplation, I hear the echo of that segregation, and empathize with the shunned. Occasionally, I hear their voices, their prayers. Just listen for a moment. That, Diane, is what attracts me to this place. Hmm, yeah, fascinating. Now, Peter, previously we've been discussing the... Yes, yes, yes. The passage in Fisher's Dreams and Visions outlining certain questionable uses for Jimson weed. That's right. Jimson weed being the main ingredient found in the tablets you discovered at Sutton Bank. Correct. Would you like a full recap here, Diane? Or... No, no, not necessary. No? Please continue. Okay. Well, as I said before, the next step in my inquiries was to seek out the friends of the deceased, Patrick Jones and Richard Gordon. But after reading that passage in Dreams and Visions, I felt a little trepidation. You see, these young men, boys really, had managed to get their hands on a rare and potent hallucinogen, a psychoactive drug very similar in its effects to the infamous South American brew, ayahuasca. Just how they stumbled upon the drug remains undetermined, though I suspect Jones's extensive collection of rare books might have pointed the boys in the right direction. Yes. If memory serves, it was October the 7th or 8th when I summoned DCI Brent to my door. I was eager to know what, if anything, the police had learned over the preceding days. But Brent had little to tell me, other than that the lab had been unable to match the coarse hairs found at the scene and under Smith's fingernails with those belonging to any animal on record. Inconclusive was the official determination. Nor could anything definitive be said of the bite marks on Smith's upper arm, not to mention the claw mark on his face. I asked if he had talked to Smith's friends, Jones and Gordon, to which he said yes, he had, but that the pair hadn't seen their friend for several days, not since parting ways with him on the outskirts of Hamerton, the day of his disappearance. I suspect Brent knew what I was about to ask before the words left my mouth, as, in response to what must have been a very particular look on my face, he had withdrawn a small notebook from his shirt pocket and proceeded to write out the boys' addresses. I thanked him for the information, and reassured him that my line of questioning would be strictly professional, which wasn't much by way of reassurance, given the nature of the case and the nature of my profession. <laughs> oh, 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 Nancy, oh, oh, get Mr. Van Melson oh. some water, will you? Yeah, yeah, oh. of course. Oh. <laughs> Are you all right? Oh. Oh, nothing to worry about, Diane. <laughs> oh, this usually takes care of it. Hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Nance. Now then, <clears throat> where was I? Ah, I informed Brent that I was keen to visit the boys as soon as possible, for I felt that the clarity with which they'd recall events would only diminish as the days and weeks wore on. So, Brent, sharp as a blade, there on the spot, contacted the parents of Jones and Gordon to inquire as to their availability. Brent was informed that the boys were strictly housebound, both of them afraid to leave their respective homes, following the news of Smith's passing. Secure in the knowledge that I'd be able to reach them without difficulty, Brent left me to my own devices. I spent the remainder of the day musing over my forthcoming role as interrogator, carefully developing an appropriate line of questioning. I was, after all, visiting these boys in an unofficial capacity, and didn't want their parents to deny me the opportunity to speak with them following some ill-considered faux pas on my part. With a sense of readiness about me, I gave the bus timetable a once-over, and determined to make the twenty-minute journey to Hamerton the following morning. The long hours came and went, and soon enough 
I found myself in the presence of Richard Gordon, seventeen at the time. He was a quiet, elusive character, who had little, if anything, to say to me. The boy was escorted to the living room by his unusually tall and overzealous mother, and, annoyingly, was closely monitored by her throughout our mostly one-sided conversation. On her son's behalf, she had a nasty habit of answering all the questions I put to him, and considering that this lady had little to no involvement in Richard's private life, as was evidenced by her total ignorance of everything he'd been party to, her general presence and know-it-all demeanour was of absolutely no benefit whatsoever to my line of inquiry. Pah! In the end, I learned nothing at all from the boy— other than that he appeared to be the shrinking violet of his peer group, the one who went along with the ideas of others without question or argument. I did, however, glean something of interest from the boy's mother, the very curious and possibly relevant fact that another friend of Gordon's circle had recently passed away. It wasn't clear to me whether or not Brent was privy to this fact at the time, though it did occur to me that perhaps the police hadn't considered this other boy's suicide relevant to the case at hand. Mrs. Gordon had very little to say on the matter. She was far too preoccupied with the business of showing me the door. But at least I'd have something else to discuss with the other friend of Grant Smith, Patrick Jones, who lived but a couple of minutes' walk away, on the very same street. Sorry to interrupt, Peter, but— how did you know this other boy had committed suicide? In telling me of the boy's passing, Mrs. Gordon had put an imaginary noose around her neck, and, well, you get the picture. Yeah. Yes. As I was saying, Jones lived down the street, so I tottered along, eager as a puppy, and rapped upon his door. Suffice it to say that I was relieved to discover that Jones's mother wasn't quite as overbearing as Gordon's had been. In fact, Mrs. Jones, a patient lady with a pleasant air about her, had offered me a cup of tea, in stark contrast to my experience with Richard's mother, who hadn't offered me so much as a glass of water, and was more than happy to leave the boy and I to our discussions. I suspect that Mrs. Jones was hoping that my line of inquiry, as opposed to that of the police, would open Patrick up somewhat. The moment I stepped into the boy's bedroom, I knew that I'd encountered the group's ringleader. Though Patrick himself was quiet and somewhat restrained, his bedroom told of an individual obsessed with the darker side of life. Monstrous and demonic images adorned his walls, amidst bookshelves filled to the brim with volumes on the occult, ritual magic, and the paranormal. Huge, melted candles occupied the window sill and the numerous tabletops, whereupon piles of jotters and sketchbooks towered, their covers stamped with words such as dreams, fantasies, journeys, and visions. Much of it, to my experienced eye, was the virtuous product of the inquiring teenage mind. But some of it, writings on the subject of uh, psychedelic journeys, for example, filled me with a sense of foreboding— the contents of that room, I felt, belonged to a heart of darkness in the making. The boy said he was an artist, an aspiring writer, too, and that the environment he'd built around himself, much to the frustration of his parents, was designed to aid the creative process. To my mind, it was clear that it was more than just the creative process the youngster wished to aid, and there was a pungent odour in the air, evidently belonging to the boy's personal stash of those fetid jimson weed pills I'd found at Sutton Bank. I tell you, Diane, the smell of that stuff was foul. And you sure this wasn't just the general pong of a teenager's bedroom? I can assure you it wasn't. Please continue. <clears throat> well, in talking to the young Patrick Jones in that squalid bedroom— I learned that there had been a group of four friends, Patrick, Richard Gordon, the late Grant Smith, and one James Barker, the boy who had 
committed suicide. The group, with Jones at the helm, had developed an interest in what they described as walks, Jimson weed induced psychedelic experiences, in which Patrick would attempt to guide his friends through the strange hallucinatory dreamscapes he said the drug commonly induced. With his referral to Jimson weed, I asked him how he had first happened upon the drug, or punk, as he and his friends referred to it, and much to my disappointment, the boy claimed to have manufactured the pills himself. A claim I felt was untrue, due to the scarcity of Jimson weed in Britain, and the complexity of the finished product. I was certain that the boy was protecting his source, whomever that might be. A drug dealer? I suspect so. Though, as I've said, Jones maintains to this day that he manufactured the drug himself. Although he offered <clears throat> little with regards to the passing of his friend, Grant Smith, he was able to talk in detail about the death of his other friend, James Barker. Essentially, Jones, along with Gordon and Smith, his willing accomplices in all supernatural forays, convinced Barker to pop-punk and go for a walk, as it were, guided by Jones. What exactly the punk would do to Barker, and where precisely the walk would take him, was anybody's guess. In answer to my question on how he got into the whole psychedelic journey business, Jones said that the idea simply came to him one day, though, as I've already intimated, I believe the idea came to him much in the way the punk came to him. <laughs> but I digress. The four of them gathered together in Jones's bedroom, and the stage was set for a psychedelic journey. Barker popped the punk as Jones put it, and went for a walk. Is this the kind of thing you'd read about in, what was it, uh, Fisher's Dreams and Visions? Precisely, Diane. And what dreams and visions that poor boy had. There, in the circle, illuminated by a handful of candles, Jones, Gordon, and Smith listened, as Barker wandered into a strange house at the heart of a vast forest wherein he met a bent figure, a shadow that walked with a cane, a thing that didn't speak but laughed, laughed relentlessly, laughed when Barker turned to flee, laughed when he found himself lost, laughed as he fell to his knees screaming, and was laughing still as he was summoned back to reality by a sweating and panicked Patrick Jones. Blimey. Never mind that, Diane. My reaction was similar. But Barker's nightmare didn't end there. He was driven mad, Joan said, prone to uncontrollable outbursts of laughter, whatever the occasion. And in moments of lucidity, all Barker would talk about was the man with the cane, how this figure stalked him at night, mocking and laughing at him. Within a week of his walk, James Barker took his own life. According to Jones, and this was later confirmed by Brent, who unfortunately had to revisit the case, Barker was found hanging from a beam in his bedroom, a huge ear-to-ear -ear grin filling his face. Wait, the grin? Just like Smith? Smith, yes. But it wasn't long after Barker's suicide that young Patrick, too, found himself afraid to go to bed at night. Picture the scene, Diane. It's the middle of the night. Jones in his silent bedroom, surrounded by demonic imagery and occult trinkets, fully awake, waiting. <laughs> Hello? Who, who's there? Who is that? Come on, stop it. Stop that. What do you want? Barker, is that you? Barker? What's all the shouting about? 
about? It's it's nothing. What the hell are you laughing at? <laughs> You see, Patrick's sister believed that it was just her brother laughing in the night, and this continued for weeks, was still happening at the time I met with him, in fact. The laughing man would creep through the house, laughing all the way, until reaching Patrick's bedroom. In response to all this, thinking himself something of an expert in the occult, Jones endeavoured to host another journey into the unknown, and somehow managed to convince the late Grant Smith to pop punk and go for a walk. Sorry, one moment, Peter. Nance, can you prep some tea and biscuits for the intermission? I'm on it. Again, this is consistently fascinating, Peter. So it is. But that which fascinates usually has a tendency to bite, too. I'm beginning to see that. (laughs) Yes, yes. Please continue. Well, as you've probably guessed, Grant Smith went for a walk, and, according to Jones, returned disturbed. Just as it was with Barker, Smith found himself within the walls of the same strange house at the heart of a vast forest. But within, it wasn't a man with a cane the boy encountered— It was a creature of some sort, a hairy beast, all mouth, he said, a huge, grinning mouth, you see? And it laughed at him relentlessly. In the days that followed, Smith claimed to be seeing this thing everywhere, in the trees by the park, amongst the hedges by the cemetery, and in the fields by his house, always watching, he said, and always pointing with a bony, outstretched arm, and grinning. And Smith was much the same the last time Jones claimed to have seen him. Babbling he was about the beast, how it was coming for him, how it meant to eat him. Now, I think it's important to reiterate that Smith and Barker before him had both used punk, but there was something else— a critical detail that almost slipped Jones's mind during our long conversation. Prior to the group's first psychedelic journey, Barker had been bitten by something in Jones's bedroom. Jones said that he would have forgotten about it completely, if it hadn't been for the fact that Smith, too, had been bitten prior to his walk. And this is where the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle started to fit together, Diane. What if? I thought, a questing wandermoth sent out into the world by our would-be vampire had made its way into Jones's bedroom, stinging Barker and later Smith. What if these hallucinogenic stings, coupled with the boy's punk-induced phantasmagoria, had in some inexplicable way afforded Barker and Smith a glimpse through the vampire's conduit into its lair? the so-called strange house at the heart of a vast forest. Another unfortunate setback for our ravenous seducer, wouldn't you say? That's one heck of a theory, Peter. It was, Diane, and that wasn't all. Furthermore, I wondered, could it be possible that the things the boys saw there, Barker, the man with the cane, Smith, the grinning beast, came to some semblance of life, just like the winged furball of Wigan, that whisked the Hargreaves girl away. I mean, how else was I to explain what had happened to those youngsters? Well, it was something to work with, anyway. I also surmised that Jones himself must have been stung at some point, too. The laughing man at his bedroom door night after night was surely evidence of such. As for Barker and Smith— They were driven to the brink by their stalking apparitions, Barker to suicide, Smith to hapless delirium. How long these tangible hallucinations might survive for was a point I refused to dwell on for any length of time. The notion always brought me back to the Hargreave school. What happened to her, and what became of the creature that took her? 
I had one final question for young Patrick, though. Was there anything else he could tell me about the strange house the boys had visited on their walks? I asked him to describe the place for me, but, unfortunately, the descriptions offered by Barker and Smith had been vague and dim. What about Richard Gordon? What was his role in all of this? Well, according to Jones, Gordon was only ever a spectator. My initial impression of him had been evidently well-founded. So, I left Jones's place, having reassured him that all would be well, provided he stayed away from the punk. As for the laughing man, I believed that only one thing would stop the apparition in the form of James Barker from showing up at Jones's bedroom door night after night, and that was to locate the strange house at the heart of a vast forest. No easy task. Back at home, I scoured the library for books on the subject of infamous haunted houses and abandoned country estates in North Yorkshire. Having pored over my topographical reference books, I made note of a vast area of coastal moorland, whose isolated farms and obscure hamlets seemed worthy of further investigation. And it was with that in mind that I decided to hit the road. The city of Manchester was calling. A certain bookshop in the northern quarter, operated by an old acquaintance of mine, the Venerable Norman Kane. Okay, Peter. I think that's probably a good place to stop. Certainly. Intermission, Andy. And just in time. Okay, beeps coming in five, four, three. Just kill it, will you? <laughs> Dream stealer. Job an owl. Whoa! Hey, come on. That's a bit <laughs> harsh, isn't it? That's all we have time for today, folks. You've been listening to the Woodrow Show with your host, Diane Woodrow. <laughs> Today's guest has been the renowned paranormal investigator, Peter Van Melsen. Our conversation on the subject of the Hamilton horror will continue next Thursday at 8pm. In the meantime, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments section. Until next time. Got it, Andy? Yeah, yeah, of course I have. OK, Peter. Time for another break. Oh, yes, yeah, sir. And time for another cigarette. Do you need anything else, Diane? No, we're good, thanks. Are we good to go, Andy? Whenever you're ready, Dee. Hello, you're listening to The Woodrow Show. This is your host, Diane Woodrow. Today we'll once again be continuing our conversation with renowned paranormal investigator Peter Van Melsen as he recounts his involvement in the Hammerton Horror. Mm -hmm. The dreadful events surrounding a group of curious teenagers and a remote estate on oh, the Yorkshire coast. Where are those bloody things? Looking for these? Oh! <laughs> oh, yes. Please, continue. I'm talking to Peter in the seclusion of his favourite haunt, Rosedale Chapel, here in the quiet North Yorkshire village of the same name. I believe you were about to tell us about your trip to see a friend about a book. Ah, yes. Of course. As I was saying, my old friend Norman was bound to have a tome or two on the subject of haunted houses, particularly those located throughout the British Isles. I use the word haunted for lack of a better word to describe the nature of dwellings in which strange or macabre events have rendered them uninhabitable. I've often found that the most comprehensive studies on the subject, naturally, are conducted by those with a genuine interest in the supernatural or unexplained phenomena. Now, I must preface this account by saying that Kane's Rare Books is by no means a specialist dealer in esoterica and the occult. Norman's collection is as multifarious as it is formidable. I'll be sure to reiterate that in the episode description, Peter. Much obliged, Diane. But, with that said, Norman is in possession of one or two volumes that are not so easily acquired these days. One of these is Charles Baxter's Tainted Tenements, first published 1898, 
which deals with supernatural activity in domestic households. Another is the more recent Book of Abandon, which lists estates and premises of ill repute throughout the country. Book of Abandon found its way into the hands of private collectors in the late 1990s. Its author is unknown. I'm familiar with Baxter's works, but I can't say Book of Abandon rings a bell. Well, it notes the approximate whereabouts of certain hard-to-find properties. Rare book collectors are always on the lookout for it, due to the fact that its contents continue to provide evidence in support of a long-standing rumour, a rumour suggesting that, in years gone by, certain wealthy landowners paid exorbitant amounts of money to the government in order to have their remote acreages scratched from the land registry. To what end? Allegedly to conduct controversial business with impunity. Smells fishy to me, Peter. Fishy indeed, Diane. Though I must tell you, it was the very same rumour that led me to seek out the book in question. I felt assured that Cain would be in possession of a copy, and that its contents would shed light on that which I sought. A strange house at the heart of a vast forest. And with a bit of luck, it might just offer some insight into the whereabouts of our would-be vampire, too. Could our mysterious mastermind be a descendant of a family whose homestead had been scratched from the land registry in centuries past? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, my assumptions were of absolutely no value hovering above my head in the void that passes for my library and so I made plans to make the journey to Manchester. By train, naturally. Gaines Rare Books is centrally located, on Tibb Street in Manchester's northern quarter, but it's easily overlooked, owing to the fact that the shopfront is one of the narrowest in the city. A slim doorway is all that shields its glorious interior from the wandering gaze of a nonchalant metropolitan population. Not a city man, are you, Peter? Forgive me, Diane. I'll just get to the point. Norman was expecting me, and I was relieved to step into the safety of his lair, as it were, and out of the crisp mid-October cold that had gnawed at my cheeks since departing Victoria Station. Hmm. How would one describe the man? He's a quiet Lancastrian, usually well-dressed, and most notably sports a pair of prosthetic hands. You wouldn't miss him in a crowd, Diane. <laughs> and he wouldn't mind me saying so either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but these details aside, Norman is an honest, reliable fellow, fiercely dedicated to his work. Anyway, we took our usual places by the piano that serves as a bookshelf. I visit at least twice a year, you know and I talked him through the whole bit. Other than the occasional verbal nod, he kept his mouth shut throughout, but I could tell the cogs were whirring, and as soon as my monologue reached its conclusion, he was up on his feet in quest of the Book of Abandon. So there I was, sitting by the piano, eyeballing a rather attractive first edition of Daphne de Maurier's Rebecca, when Norman returned to my side, clutching the aforementioned book. He dropped it into my lap, and proceeded to recount the circumstances surrounding its acquisition. Apparently, the book had made its way onto the shelves of a charity shop on the outskirts of Preston. The shop's owner, a friend of Kane's, made contact with him after noticing the book, wedged between a couple of tattered hardbacks towards the back of the shop. And he had no idea how it ended up there? None whatsoever. Perhaps there's something in the name Book of Abandon that determines its fate. <laughs> Nevertheless, Norman was quick to collect it, knowing only too well its potential value. An odd volume, by all accounts. Hardback, this edition, complete with dust jacket. But the cover featured no text whatsoever. A blank, navy blue buckram met my gaze, offering no indication of what awaited me within. Genuine copies are identified by a curious watermark on the book's first page, the letters A.A.B., 
Some claim the letters are the author's initials, but this, of course, is conjecture. Whomever the author is, or was, as the case may be, he or she is privy to a great deal of forbidden information. Is Kane's copy genuine? Oh, absolutely. There's no mistaking that watermark. Anyway, there we were, Norman and me, poring over the thing, scouring its plentiful pages, in search of hidden houses on the moorlands and coastal regions of North Yorkshire. Just picture it, Diane. The two of us, walled in by rare tomes by the piano, sifting through the pages of a book of secrets. The Blackwood Estate. Robin's Cove. Why does that ring a bell? Robin's Cove. It's on the coast, for sure. It's triggered something, Norman. Though I can't be sure what, exactly. An old case? I think so. It says here, The Blackwood Estate, Robin's Cove, north of Whitby. Sprawling estate, large mansion hemmed in by forest. Is that it? Certainly sounds like it. Hmm. One moment. Blackwood. Mm, Blackwood. Where are you? Mm. Aha! What is it? Blackwood. Thomas Blackwood. Chemist. I knew I'd heard the name before. Thomas Blackwood? Yeah. Listen, this is an old book. A sort of 19th century who's who for the northern counties. Hmm. Blackwood operated a pharmacy in York. Hmm. Made a fortune selling homemade remedies and overpriced placebos. Oh. Had quite a reputation throughout North Yorkshire. And according to this here book, mm-hmm. spent his winters in the city and his summers on the cove. Robin's Cove? Could be. But the plot thickens. Hmm. Towards the end of the Industrial Revolution, there were a number of deaths in York each one of them attributed to the consumption of arsenic. Mm. Blackwood, the bugger, was putting the stuff in his tonics, Ooh. appetite stimulants and the like. My word! Oh. As I said, had quite the reputation. Could it be that he paid his way out of trouble and in doing so paid his way to exile? Hmm. An intriguing supposition, old friend. What is it, Peter? It's like you said... An old case. Do you remember that, uh, situation in Fossbridge back in 98? How could I forget? Could it be that those events were somehow tied to this Blackwood character? I shouldn't think so. The chap would have been over 200 years old. Oh, (laughs) yes, yes. I suppose so. I suppose so. But still. Situation in Fossbridge? Well, Diane, I should, in the first instance, address the nature of my professional relationship with Norman Kane. I've had a fascinating but difficult career, and on a number of occasions I've been in need of assistance. In my line of work, there are few individuals one can turn to, this being due to the very niche nature of the job. But Norman, with his eclectic collection of rare books and Armed with the knowledge such tomes impart, has always been an incredibly reliable repository of information, whether my queries border on the natural or the supernatural. So vital has his assistance been at times, that I've invited him along on a number of cases. One such case involved a spate of individuals coming back from the dead in the small hamlet of Fossbridge, near Whitby. Coming back from the dead? Did I hear that right? A dreadful case, by all accounts. Hmm. Hi, can I help you? Who is that? Excuse me? What is it, Nance? Uh, not uh, sure. Oh. Sorry? Oh, j- Nancy? Tell, tell Peter I'll, I'll be in touch. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry, Diane. I'm not sure who that was, or what he wanted. Never mind, Nancy. He lives in the village. Gets confused, that's all. Someone you know, Peter? His name is Wilfred. Lives a few doors down from the chapel here. Pesters me to look into the death of his wife whenever he bumps into me. 
Have you looked into the death of his wife? That's just it, Diane. Wilfred never married. Like I said, gets confused. His sort tend to end up in places like this, unfortunately. Places like this? Quiet places. Out-of-the-way places. Some folks just never get used to it. But you've got used to it, of course. Well, Diane, I believe we've already established that I'm not a city man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, about those people who came back from the dead... Oh, I'll get there, Diane. <clears throat> but first, allow me to take you back to my discussion with Norman. Yes. Well, I felt rather strongly that the strange house at the heart of a vast forest I sought was, in fact, the Blackwood estate mentioned in the Book of Abandon. Blackwood's shady history certainly added a great deal of plausibility to the idea that he had paid his way to exile, as Norman put it. And to boot, there was the mention of Robin's Cove, a name etched into my memory following that particularly gruesome case nearby. I was satisfied that I had gleaned all the information I could from Norman and the Book of Abandon, and so, with his kind permission, I borrowed his Who's Who Book of 1852, which in reality was named Directory of Tradesmen or something along those lines, and returned, post-haste, to the quiet and isolated splendour of Rosedale. But there was something else, Diane— something that troubled me a lot more than I was prepared to admit at the time. Well, upon leaving the bookshop, I stepped out into the bustle of a Friday afternoon in the northern quarter, and made my merry way along Tibb Street onto Thomas Street, in the direction of the train station. But it was just as I was passing the south end of Salmon Street, a dreary place at the best of times, that I saw something loitering at the back of the centre for Chinese contemporary art. Now, given all we've discussed thus far, I imagine you formed a fairly robust, if not completely irrational, image of the things allegedly witnessed by the teenagers in this case. Bizarre apparitions born of wonder moth stings and punk-induced phantasmagoria, etc. Well— the thing my gaze fell upon in the shade of that building on Salmon Street was precisely the creature that had been described to me by Patrick Jones, the monstrous entity that had stalked Grant Smith following a visit to that strange house during his punk-induced trip. I saw a huge, hulking shape, covered with hair, rocking back and forth as if unable to steady itself. But worst of all, Diane— Across its grotesque face was a terrible, ear-to-ear -ear grin, revealing row after row of razor-sharp teeth. Ooh. But it didn't come after me, this creature. It simply gazed and grinned. And, as I turned to flee, I heard laughter, the shrill tones of a tortured individual, the haunter of Patrick Jones's nightmares, James Barker, a.k.a. The Laughing Man. I tell you, Diane, I was out of there faster than the top speed of the train I was about to board. I can almost picture it, Peter. But why? I mean, why did it, or they, appear to you? Well, I'll never know for sure. But I feel quite strongly that I was stung during my time in Patrick Jones's bedroom. It's possible that the... Pesky Wandermoth, responsible for the whole mess, had remained there. If anything, I believe the vision was intended as a warning. Something was crying, cease and desist. It troubled me terribly, Diane, but I didn't want to dwell on it too much. It was absolutely vital that I remained focused on the task at hand. I was more concerned with the true nature of the strange house at the heart of a vast forest that— mysterious nexus existing simultaneously in both the waking world and the punk-induced illusory world, the nature of it and of the thing that might dwell there. Our would-be vampire. Precisely. 
Strange sightings aside, I made my way back to Rosedale without incident, and spent several days in solitude, studying the book I borrowed from Norman. I absorbed everything I could learn about Thomas Blackwood, and was, fortuitously, able to find a number of references to the chemist in several books in my collection. The commonalities were as follows. Blackwood was a wealthy, quiet individual, well respected amongst his peers, the owner of at least three properties between York and Whitby, and the chief suspect in a number of arsenic-related deaths. Other than the reference in the Book of Abandon, though, I could find absolutely no mention whatsoever of Robin's Cove. The town, hamlet, estate, or whatever you might want to call it, simply did not exist, which, naturally, meant that I had to find it. <laughs> yes, yes. Which brings us to an important point, Peter. It seems that you confirmed the rumour that landowners once paid to have their estates removed from the land registry. Well, yes, but, as is often the case with my work, the natural aspects are often of secondary concern. But still, revelations like that can only add plausibility to other areas of your work. On that point, Diane, the jury is still out. I'm sure it is. Please continue. Well, at the very least, I had a direction in which to head, the North Yorkshire coast. But before making the journey, I felt it pertinent to check in with DCI Brent. Following an invitation, he was rapping on my door within the hour, <laughs> always a punctual fellow, Mark. He asked what, if anything, I had learned regarding the case, and so I related at length my researches, my talks with the boys Gordon and Jones, and my visit to Manchester, omitting to mention, out of general courtesy, the creature I saw on Salmon Street. In turn, I asked what he had learned regarding the case, to which he answered solemnly and honestly, very little. It was clear from the way in which he spoke that he was almost hopeful that a supernatural force was behind the death of Grant Smith, if only to alleviate an overwhelming sense of failure on his behalf a sense that I felt was ill-placed. I, on the other hand, found myself wishing the opposite, if only natural causes could be attributed to the deaths of Smith and Barker. And so I bade farewell to Brent, promising to keep him informed of further developments. That night, as my head hit the pillow, I fought to keep the vision of that appalling creature out of my head— Fought futilely, I might add. I had further visions of it coming to me in the middle of the night, creeping along the silent landing in the direction of my bedroom door, laughing and wailing at me on the other side. Perhaps whatever is behind all of this can sense my intentions, I thought. It's revealing itself in an effort to intimidate me. Such thoughts brought me back to my senses. As long as I still draw breath— I'll be coming for you, I whispered to the darkness surrounding me. I'll be coming for you. Did it show itself to you again that night? Fortunately not, Diane. Fortunately not. I slept like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> the following day, by this time we were in the fourth week of October, I started to make arrangements for a journey across the moors, in the direction of Fossbridge. The town in which people were, how did you phrase it, coming back from the dead? Exactly. I had to go back. I dimly recalled the residents there speaking of the mysterious Robin's Cove, if only furtively. If I'd heard it anywhere, I'd heard it there. I think we'll break here, Peter. Mm -hmm. Andy? Got it all. I'll leave it running until you've recorded your outro. Thanks. That's all for today, folks. You've been listening to The Woodrow Show, with me, your host, Diane Woodrow. Today's guest has been the renowned paranormal investigator, Peter Van Melsen. Our conversation on the subject of the Hamilton Horror will continue next Thursday at 8pm. In the meantime, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments section. Until next time. We're good, Andy. 
All good. Although I'm familiar with the story, it's surprising how much of it has been completely ignored by mainstream media. Well, tis a world of ignorance we live in, unfortunately. I can't argue with that. You look a little washed out, Diane. Care for a cigarette? Okay, Dan, we are rolling. Okay, thanks, Andy. It's Trevor Stewart, Diane. Stick it on silent, I'll call him back. No probs. <clears throat> Hello, you're listening to The Woodrow Show. This is your host, Diane Woodrow. We'll be continuing our conversation with renowned paranormal investigator Peter Van Melsen today. Yes. <laughs> as he recounts his investigation into the Hamilton Horror the widely publicised case involving the fates of several teenagers and an isolated property on the Yorkshire coast. Yes. Mm. I'm sitting with Peter in the foyer of Rosedale Chapel, here in the beautiful Howardian Hills of North Yorkshire. <coughs> We've discussed the discovery of Grant Smith's body at Sutton Bank, the unusual interests of the group of friends with whom Smith was involved, and Peter's misgivings regarding the strange house and its mysterious occupant at the centre of the case. Now, Peter, mm -hmm. I believe you had an inkling as to where you might find further information regarding the whereabouts of this strange house. Yes, yes. Fosbridge, near Whitby, the town of the reanimated. As I said, I was all but convinced I'd overheard talk of Robin's Cove during my time there. And, despite my reluctance to return in light of what happened there all those years ago, I was determined to mark the location of that strange house on a map. But before I discuss my return to Fosbridge with you, Diane, I feel I should bring you up to speed with what went on back in '98, the awful business of the dead coming back to life. Hmm. Well, as is often the case— for reasons I've yet to establish, I might add. I happened to be passing through the quiet village of Fosbridge, when, as fate would have it, a chance encounter with a nervous villager alerted me to the trouble at hand. I have to admit, trepidation was already upon me, owing to the general absence of life in the village, and the twitching of curtains in the numerous windows overlooking the deserted streets. It was following a glance in the direction of such a window that the talkative villager emerged from an adjacent door and flagged me down. Mrs. O'Brien, originally of Cork, had ostensibly recognised my gaunt visage from an article she'd read in Fortean Weekly, and had seized the opportunity to accost me. She was a frightfully pleasant lady. Her voice quivered with every word, and so I felt an overwhelming desire to assist her and her fellow denizens with what was evidently no trifling matter. Yes, I soon learned that the quiet village of Fosbridge had a problem with the recently deceased. <laughs> they were refusing to stay dead. <laughs> huh. Yes. I imagine Mrs. O'Brien wasn't quite so amused, Peter. Oh, oh no, absolutely not, Diane. And on my part, her account was met by an impenetrable mask of stone. Yes, if I recall correctly, she did laugh, but it was a cold and distant laugh, echoing amongst the rocks between Jupiter and Mars. Soon enough, I found myself sitting in the company of Mrs. O'Brien and her husband, Dell. Sooner still, I held between two chilly mitts a hot cup of tea. This was January of ninety-eight. And, as you probably know, winter on the North Yorkshire coast can be brutal. A little snow had fallen, too. So there I was, sipping my tea, listening to the middle-aged couple recite a tale of ghastly proportions. Once again, it had all started with the death of a boy. Philip was the boy's name. Philip had drowned in a pond some weeks earlier, and, as was the custom in Fosbridge, was quickly buried— without an autopsy or ceremony. They weren't a particularly sentimental bunch, those Fosbridges. Well, <laughs> a couple of days later, the boy's parents, Dave and Janet, I think their names were, 
had, in the middle of the night, received a visit from their only child. He'd rapped at the door repeatedly, they said, and they'd have opened the door too, if it hadn't been for the voice that shortly followed. A shrill, unfamiliar voice, a waterlogged voice, like the tones emitted by a child gargling syrup. The father, Dave, had stalled his wife at the threshold, convinced that the creature on the other side of the door was anything but their beloved son. You see, we're not talking about zombies here, Diane, those shambling, mindless creatures transferred to celluloid by the horror master Romero. No, the people coming back in Fosbridge weren't quite so corporeal. And the boy? I'm sorry? The boy, Philip. When his parents refused to answer the door, what then? Oh, yes, well, Diane. He simply evaporated. Evaporated? Yes. You see, it became apparent to certain members of the community that to deny their reanimated loved one's entrance to their homes was to deny them existence altogether. Refusals to admit their sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, etc., seemed to undo whatever incantation had been invoked to achieve the effect in the first place. Effect? Yes, the reanimated were projections. Projections designed to compel the villagers to open their doors in the middle of the night. But why? Following the case of young Philip, several other households claimed to have received visits in the night from long-dead members of the family. In each case, some faintly heard inhuman vocalization had been enough to deter them from welcoming back their much-missed relative, until, that is, the case of Mingette Ferguson. Well, Mingette was a retired widow, some eighty-five years old, living alone in a small cottage on the edge of the village. Neighbours suggested that she may have heard the voice of her long-dead husband, Frank, and a victim of advanced senility, had likely answered the call, permitting whatever it was that took the form of her dearly beloved to enter her home. What happened to her? Well, impossible to say, Diane. She disappeared, though a number of footprints in the snow outside her home suggested that she might have been led astray, led north. And it was this detail, this detail precisely, that I felt held the key to the location of Robin's Cove. When looking back at my time there, I felt sure, well, reasonably sure, that one of the Fosbridges, possibly O'Brien, had hinted that the laboured steps in the snow had taken the wanderer in the direction of that which I sought, Robin's Cove. And that, Diane, was why I wished to return to Fosbridge, to confirm the accuracy of those words I thought I had heard some twenty years before. And the reanimated? Was that the end of it? <laughs> well, as I inferred earlier, my good friend Norman Kane later joined me at Fosbridge, providing a number of grimoires from which to study and compare certain rites and incantations associated with the kind of apparitions the villagers had been subjected to. There was no way of telling when and where these spectres would appear, and so a general notice had gone out to the residents to contact Kane and I, should a stranger knock upon their door in the night, and we stationed ourselves at the North Sea Inn, waiting for a call. We were reasonably confident that if we could catch the ghosts in the act, as it were, we could beat the manipulating force into submission by invoking an appropriate incantation. You know, dispel the spell. But, in the end, nobody called. There were no further manifestations. It seemed that the thing had got what it wanted, in the form of poor old Mingette Ferguson. But what was the thing after? Hmm. What would it want with an old lady? Well, I've always held that the sorcerer responsible for the illusions in Fosbridge was after the very same thing that our would-be vampire in the Hamerton horror case was after. Essence, vitality, you name it. Sorcerer? Mm-hmm. In my line of work, Diane, a figure capable of tapping into the minds of strangers in order to conjure appropriate visions has to be a sorcerer of some kind. 
Yeah, a little archaic. But I'm an archaic man, Diane. I'm beginning to see that, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Whoa. laughs> there she blows. Nancy? Yeah? See to the doors, will you? Are we going to have any trouble with the gear, Andy? I shouldn't have thought so. It's weird, though. Weather forecast said it's supposed to be clear all day. It's April in Britain, Andy. Anything goes. Yeah, that's true. Please, continue, Peter. An advancing storm. You know, a friend of mine once described an advancing storm as imminent deliverance. Meaning? That we should yield to nature. Yes. <laughs> but enough of that. <laughs> to conclude my Fosbridge account, Kane and I reassured the locals that, fortunately, though not quite so fortunate for Mrs. Ferguson, the force behind the apparitions had found what it was looking for, and was unlikely to bother them again. We said this half-heartedly, for we were mostly clueless. Nothing is certain concerning such matters. Then I returned to Rosedale, a little deflated, where I penned an article on the subject for the short-lived periodical Journal of the Unexplained. Deflated? Mm. Well, yes, we, we failed to intervene in time, and, well, an innocent bystander paid the price. You can't win them all, Peter. No, so they say, Diane. Oh! Anyway... Twenty years later, and I was all set to return to Fosbridge. You see, I'd spoken to everybody I could on the subject. Cartographers, historians, etc. And nobody had anything definitive to say on the subject of Robin's Cove. I mean, several individuals I spoke to had heard of the place. It was just that they were unable to speak about it with any degree of confidence almost as though the mere idea of the place had been little more than a passing whisper on the wind, and to attempt to retain any knowledge of said utterance would have been too big a burden to contemplate. In the first instance, I invited old Norman to accompany me on my journey, but unfortunately he was otherwise engaged with a rare book fair in the Midlands, and so once again I set out in pursuit of my goal alone. I took a train to Whitby. This was the last week of October, and from there arranged for a taxi to escort me to Fosbridge. The driver, a burly chap with a stern countenance, balked at my request initially. But the offer of an inflated fare seemed to alleviate his concern somewhat. I have to admit, Diane, that his reaction to my request had my concerns aroused. Was Fosbridge's reputation still tarnished by what had happened all those years ago? Or had more recent events filled the cabbie with a sense of dread? Well, the journey was conducted in silence, and I was delivered to the characteristically quiet village and left to mind my own business in the centre of town. It was a pleasant day by all accounts. The sky was blue, and there wasn't the least hint of wind blowing from the coast, quite the contrast to my previous visit, under the watchful eye of a winter sun. It's still coming. But, although the weather was pleasant, Diane, the same couldn't be said for the atmosphere of the place. Now, as I'm sure you're aware by now, I'm a man who finds solace in silence, particularly when it's found in the calm streets of a quiet hamlet. But Fosbridge, as it appeared to me on that October afternoon, was positively barren. The shops I'd frequented back in 98 were all gone, either boarded up or for sale. And I can tell you, Diane, it looked as though some of those properties had been for sale for more than a couple of years. Well, I walked about a bit, observed the facade of what had once been the post office, and traversed the length of the main thoroughfare High Street, vainly, in quest of a tea room, coffee shop, or some other public place in which to pop in and say hello. Speaking of which, uh, could I trouble you for another cup of tea, my dear? Of course. Why, well, thank you. Yes. I was beginning to understand the cabbie's reluctance to take me there. 
That foreboding atmosphere was enough to scare the birds away. And it seemed to me that that had been the case, judging from the complete and utter lack of vocalizations from creatures of the ornithological variety. Ah, ah wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. No problem at all, Mr. Van Nelson. Hmm. Oh, yes. Now then, where was I? Ah, just when I thought all hope was lost, I heard something in the distance, a repetitive buzzing, the sound of a telephone ringing. A mobile? Oh, no, Diane. This was the familiar ringing of a traditional public telephone. And as I neared the source of the drone, I confirmed the fact. Just picture it, Diane. The quiet street utterly deserted. The faded red telephone box calling out to me across the leagues of silence. To that box I was drawn like a moth to a candle flame. What on earth? Hello? Peter, is that you? Yes. Is this... It's Mary. You know, Mary O'Brien. Oh. Why, hello, Mary. What's going on here? Why are you calling a telephone box? Well, I needed to speak to you. Okay. Shouldn't we meet then? No. I mean, we can't. We can't? Well, why not? Because it'll see us. That's why. What will see us? The th Thing. Uh -huh. It's out there, Peter, roaming the moors. Big and hairy it is. Mm -hmm. Doesn't look real. Just a big old ball of meat with a mouthful of teeth. Okay. It's been feeding on the sheep. What are you talking about, Mary? The beast. Out there, so it is. OK, calm down. Start from the beginning. What's going on here? And off she went. From the decline of Fosbridge following the events of 98, to the recent attacks on sheep and other livestock on the moors nearby. Her fear was a living, breathing thing, much like the beast she had repeatedly described. A creature that was covered with coarse hair, a thing with a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth. Ring any bells, Diane. The beast of Sutton Bank? Mm-hmm. The very same, yes. Huh. And exactly the description of the thing I'd caught a glimpse of on Manchester Salmon Street. Ooh. I suspected that after the creature had attacked Smith at Sutton Bank, having fulfilled some sort of malign purpose, it might have been compelled to return to where it came from, to that strange house at the heart of a vast forest, and not the house of the illusory world, as visited by the Hamilton boys under the influence of punk, no. It would seek out the houses it existed in the waking world. For, after all, it was now a tangible life form. But what I hadn't suspected was the possibility that it would continue to hunt along the way, driven by an appalling and otherworldly bloodlust. And so... Not wanting to further agitate Mrs. O'Brien, I tried to distract her from the subject of the beast by asking about Robin's Cove. And immediately, and in no uncertain terms, she warned me off the place, told me that under no circumstances should I seek it out, that the bay and the forest that overlooks it were forsaken, that only a fool would want to go there. I'm betting she told you how to get there anyway. On the contrary. Mary point-blank refused to reveal its location. And she wouldn't budge on the subject, either. She was much too concerned with the matter of the beast. So, in the end, I had little choice but to explain to her that the thing on the prowl was more than likely headed in the direction of Robin's Cove, that whatever was out there, be it an occupied house or an abandoned estate, it was likely the creature's ultimate destination. Did that have the desired effect? Unfortunately not. My explanation might have quelled her fear somewhat, 
but she had no intention of sending me to Robin's Cove, and assured me that none of her neighbours would either. Forsaken, she continued to say, and that was her final word on the subject. That was it. She hung up and left me standing there in the telephone box. Charming. She was, yes. <laughs> on both occasions. <laughs> <laughs> But if nothing else, Diane, I had been able to confirm that Robin's Cove did, in fact, exist. And so, once again, I returned to Rosedale with another nugget of information, and felt fairly confident with regards to my next step. The only step, really, considering all that had transpired thus far. I spoke with DCI Brent, who once again was at my door within two shakes of a lamb's tail, and brought him up to speed concerning the retreating beast, and the confirmation of the existence of the mysterious Robin's Cove. I was also sure to inform my good friend Norman Kane of the developments, particularly as he and I had spent several weeks in and out of Mrs. O'Brien's company back in 98. Which reminds me, Peter, isn't it odd that Mrs. O'Brien didn't want to speak with you face to face? I mean, you allayed her suspicions somewhat. Just sounds so odd. You've beaten me to the punch, Diane. <laughs> well, in all seriousness, there was a very good reason Mary didn't want to speak with me in person. A reason revealed to me several days later, after DCI Brent had a couple of officers pay a visit to the quiet town of Fosbridge. She was dead, Diane. Blimey. Died in ninety-eight shortly after Norman and I departed. In fact, Fosbridge had been abandoned entirely. A regular ghost town. Makes you wonder if that telephone box was still connected to the exchange. The call was placed by an imitator. A would-be vampire in another guise. The sorcerer behind the scenes, whatever you want to call it. You see, this thing, whatever it was, was desperate to throw me off its trail. Its appearance in Manchester did nothing to deter me, and so it had sought other methods to dissuade me. However, in trying to scare me off, it had clumsily confirmed the existence of Robin's Cove, and therefore I was very close to locating its lair. But to face it, whatever it was, I needed more, and that would involve a second meeting with Patrick Jones, a meeting in which I might just be convinced to pop some punk, and go for a walk. Uh, and it's that time again, Diane. Thanks, Andy. We've reached our limit for episode four, Peter. Indeed. Fancy another cup, Peter? I drink the stuff like it's going out of fashion, Diane. <laughs> Evidently. Just a minute or so left for the outro, Dick. OK, Andy. <laughs> That's all we have time for today, folks. You've been listening to The Woodrow Show with me, your host... Diane Woodrow. Today's guest has been renowned paranormal investigator Peter Van Melsen. Our conversation regarding the Hamilton horror will continue next Thursday at 8pm. In the meantime, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments section. Until next time. Got it. OK, we'll take ten. Can I take that for you, Mr. Van Melsen? Why, thank you. I'll hold on to mine, thanks, Nance. Whenever you're ready, Diane. Okie dokie. Hello, you are listening to The Woodrow Show. This is your host, Diane Woodrow. Our conversation with renowned PI Peter Van Melsen continues today as he recounts his experiences investigating the Hamilton Horror the tragic tale of a group of misguided youths and a strange house on the Yorkshire coast. I'm talking with Mr Van Melsen in the foyer of his refuge of choice, Rosedale Chapel, here in the Howardian Hills of North Yorkshire. As you can no doubt hear, a rather aggressive storm has taken us by surprise this afternoon, a poignant reminder of the unpredictability of day-to-day -day life. Peter... Tell us about your second encounter with the figurehead of the group, Patrick Jones. Well, Diane, 
It was time to see for myself what the boys had seen, to journey the way they had journeyed, and to do that, a particular frame of mind was required, a frame of mind induced by the foul-smelling tablets I'd found by the body of Grant Smith, the Jimson weed infused punk. To be honest, I wasn't too keen on the idea, but it wasn't to be the first time something other than blood had flowed through my veins. I didn't mess about, Diane. The day after my return from Fosbridge, with Halloween fast approaching, I found myself at Jones's door, eager to press him on the subject of his guided journeys, or walks, as he called them. Jones was home alone, which was fortuitous, given the nature of my visit. A lengthy conversation with Mrs. Jones on the matter would have been highly inconvenient. The clock was ticking, and my patience was waning. Listen, the storm's moving off. <laughs> Marvellous. Unsettled by the storm, Peter? Oh, it isn't the storm that has me unsettled, Diane. It's what comes with it. Meaning? In this case, nothing, thank heavens. But there's always the next time. Strange things move with storms, Diane. Hide in the clouds, mutter amongst the thunderclaps. But I digress. Jones escorted me to his bedroom, or den, being a more appropriate term for that place, and there we sat, discussing the nature of my visit. Initially, I sensed that Jones was excited by the idea of walking me through that other world of his, but latterly, as the full extent of my intentions were revealed, involving a dangerous entity of indeterminate origin, the lad's enthusiasm waned somewhat. He grew fearful, in fact, when I explained the nature of the creature that haunted him, the thing that took the form of the Laughing Man, of how it came to be, thanks to the boy's experiments with punk. Regardless, I produced the small tin I'd found at Sutton Bank, and opened it, whilst reaffirming my intentions. I tell you, Diane, the smell of those awful pills had intensified royally. It was positively repellent. <laughs> but needs must when the devil drives, and I knew what had to be done. Well, Patrick proceeded to explain his process to me, one I wasn't completely unfamiliar with, owing to the wonderfully informative pages of Fisher's dreams and visions. According to Patrick, the pauper of the punk sits back in a comfortable position, while the guide, in this case Jones, gently induces a state of deep relaxation. And so I swallowed one of those fetid tablets, sat back, and listened to the sound of the lad's voice. I have to admit, he had a natural aptitude for it. I was rather surprised, given his youthfulness and general lack of experience. Had you been hypnotised before? Once, Diane. An attempt at past life regression. But, as I was told at the time, I'm, I'm not particularly receptive to suggestion, and so hadn't placed much stock in the process. This time, however, aided by the punk, that horrible Jimson weed pill that even then was repeating on me, my suggestibility was intensified, resulting in a heightened sense of awareness. All at once I felt completely detached from my physical self, a state entirely dissimilar to that which one experiences when falling asleep. It was as though I was standing at the bottom of a deep, dark pit, looking out into impenetrable darkness, completely disembodied, and then, surrounding me in the void, came the familiar sound of Patrick's dulcet tones. Okay, Mr. Van Nelson, where are you? He asked. And as the question filtered through to my brain, I no longer saw the blackness, but instead found myself enclosed by dense woodland. I'm in the woods, I answered, feeling sure that that was where I was supposed to be. It was an incredibly visceral experience, Diane. I felt the cool of the air about me, and the scent of pinewood was strong in my nostrils. And, curiously, I was aware of my body again. Ahead of you, there's a gravel track. Follow it. 
and there it was, a gravel track winding through the trees in the direction of who knows what. I did as the boy instructed, and followed it, only too aware of the sound of gravel beneath my shoes. Cautiously, I edged forward along the track, taking in my surroundings. Before long, Patrick's voice sounded again. There's a house at the end of the track. Do you see it? I see it, I told the boy. And see it I did, there in the shadow of a hundred trees, hidden from the world by clutching canopies. But it wasn't nightmarish, Diane. Merely an old house, a victim of dilapidation and years of neglect. I'm approaching the door, I said. Be careful in there, Mr. Van Nelson. If he sees your face, he'll come after you. Who'll come after me? I asked. The laughing man. We'll see about that, I added. And there, in the depths of the illusion, I pushed open the tarnished door. You see, this had been my objective all along, Diane. In order to be drawn to it in the waking world, I had to explore it in the illusory world, absorb the feel of the place, learn its vibrations. How so? Well, we each of us possess a sort of internal compass, a sense of direction that, when coupled with the notion of a specific target, allows us to move towards it, heedless of practical limitations. Of course, few individuals are aware of this sense, but it's there, Diane, a sort of sixth sense, if you will. I'm not sure I follow, Peter. Let me give you an example. Have you ever been to Bristol? Yes. Point to it. Sorry? Point to it. The general direction, I mean. Oh, uh, well... Southwest, very good. Okay. Now then, have you ever been to Venice? No. Ah. Do you know roughly in which direction it lies? Uh, southeast, I would imagine. Okay, point to it. Hardly a challenge, wouldn't you say? I suppose so. The point I'm making, Diane, is that one must have a vague sense of a place's location, a rough idea of where it lies geographically in order to be able to move towards it. Visiting the house in the illusory world was a means by which to get a feel for where the real house might be located in the waking world. I see. But you have to admit, Peter, your instincts for such things are much more refined than the average person's. Experience, Diane. We're all born with the same potential. Hmm. If we could return to Jones a moment, why would he warn you about the Laughing Man? Well, the Laughing Man, the ghost of James Barker, had become Patrick's personal demon, a symptom of both his guilt following Barker's passing and the hallucination-inducing bite of a questing Wandermoth. In his mind, the only thing I would possibly encounter in that house was that which Barker had encountered, the original Laughing Man, the man with the cane. In reality, of course, he had no way of knowing what I would or wouldn't see in there. We each have our own demons, a notion that contributed to my salvation in the end. Imagine it, Diane. My lowly form on the threshold of the sorcerer's lair, deep in the illusory world, ready to enter within. Hello? Ah. Uh, hello? Is there anybody here? Where are you hiding? You can't hide indefinitely. I'm coming for you. Show yourself. Get out. What in the name? Oh. Do not come back. What was it, Peter? A vision? A glimpse, Diane. A confirmation that I was on the right track. And as I arose from that strange phantasmagoria, staring Patrick Jones in the face, the compass in my mind snapped sharply in the direction of Robin's Cove. Magnetically compelled I was, 
to the hidden Blackwood Manor, beyond a grove of trees, some five miles due north of Fosbridge. Could there be an element of remote viewing involved here, Peter? Well, Diane, I imagine the originators of remote viewing were indeed working towards the same end, that of glimpsing the distant and the unseen. But in this case, there was a much greater degree of specificity required, a keener degree of focus. The method in this case, the guided journey, or walk, as it were, in conjunction with punk, as conducted by Patrick Jones, had its origin elsewhere. And though I had my suspicions that Patrick's researches had led him in the direction of certain rare books, including a certain volume of a certain Middle Eastern flavour, I never did behold evidence of such. I imagine that even now the lad has a number of dusty tomes secreted away somewhere. You've hinted at this already, but do you have any real idea as to where he might have acquired such books? Well, I discussed the matter with the estimable Norman Kane, who, as you know by now, is incredibly knowledgeable with regards to rare and forbidden literature— and it was from him that I learned that there are very few dealers in North Yorkshire, from whom a young and inquiring individual the likes of Patrick Jones could have purchased or borrowed such a book. So yes, Diane, I have an idea. Would you care to share those ideas? But of course, that's a discussion for another time. Understood. But I notice you use the word forbidden in describing these books. Can you expand on that? Certainly. In my line of work, Diane, we investigators regularly come across information that is generally regarded as bunk, or pseudoscientific, to use a phrase I find particularly abhorrent. But if one has an open mind, it's the duty of he or she to study these, shall we say, nuggets of information with great minuteness. And in doing so, Diane, the rabbit hole expands and from out of that great abyss springs a wisdom. For example, the back roads of literature are often filled with forgotten and forbidden tomes, works by authors long dead, individuals persecuted throughout the ages, men and women who saw fit to chronicle their extraordinary discoveries. Amongst certain circles, writers and investigators such as Abdul al Hazred, Ludwig Prynn, and Thomas Karnacki are often cited as being responsible for perpetuating certain abominable secrets. But it's my personal belief that these individuals preserve the knowledge they acquired in order to warn future generations of the things that dwell in the shadows. Nameless things, waiting to return to the light. But again, Diane, these are matters for another occasion, and not strictly related to the matter at hand involving the sprawling Blackwood estate. Then please continue, Peter. I thanked the young would-be sorcerer, Patrick Jones, for his assistance, and, refusing to relate the remainder of my experience in the illusory world with him, despite his insistence I do so, I departed Hamerton, and headed home, in order to meditate in the peace and quiet of my library. And there, once again, I remained for several days, drinking coffee, smoking, contemplating. This thing, whatever it was, had attempted to ward me off on three occasions, appearing to me on the streets of Manchester, speaking to me in the guise of Mrs. O'Brien in Fosbridge, and psychically hurling me off its property during my punk-induced guided journey. But I felt that its threats were merely a form of posturing, an attempt to pass itself off as something formidable and willful. A ruse, if you will. But I've said it before, Diane. Peter Van Melsen is no pushover. <laughs> I had my suspicions from the very outset that our would-be vampire was frail of body, strong of mind and that these attempts to dissuade me were indeed very powerful illusions. So, I opted for a damage limitation approach, and, taking the decision to keep my plans to myself, 
I made arrangements to return once more to Fossbridge, to approach the Blackwood estate from a distance. The last thing I needed was a pledge of backup from DCI Brent, or even the notion of companionship from my good friend Norman Kane. No, I felt that it was imperative that I confront this mysterious figure alone, and on my own terms. And so, on November 2nd, that fateful day, I arranged for a private car hire firm to escort me directly to Fossbridge. On the journey, seated quite comfortably in the back of an anonymous-looking minivan, I studied a rare tome from my own collection, Bold Evocations, by the aforementioned Thomas Carnacki, a paranormal investigator of incredible esoteric wisdom, responsible for the penning of several grimoires throughout the early twentieth century. It was my firm belief, Diane, that a physical assault on this thing would be futile. A psychical one, however, might prove to be rather effective. As I touched upon before, I felt that our would-be vampire might be susceptible to its own personal demons, if I could but find a method through which to manifest them. I considered that Karnacki's book, coupled with what remained of the punk recovered from Sutton Bank, might just prove to be a winning combination. And what a journey that was, Diane. The sky was absolutely clear, serene even. The A-169 was quiet, and the driver, thankfully, was mindful of my need for privacy, and left me to my quiet studies. We passed the whole of Hawkeye and crested the barren tops, my heart filled with a fervent trepidation known only to men and women in the business of supernatural research. So nervous was I, in fact, that as the North Sea appeared on the horizon, and the minivan plunged into the sleepy town of Slates, it was I who broke the silence. Do you know the area well? As well as the next man, sir. Been to Fossbridge before? Once or twice. Recently? Can't say I have, sir. It's deserted these days. Fell into ruin. Following... Following what? A visit from something... Evil. Evil, sir? Something that doesn't belong. Can I ask you a question? Certainly. If you were given the power of God, what would you do about the devil? Oh, I'd do away with him, sir. Amen to that. If you were given the power of God? Uh, a metaphor, Diane. Karnacki, in his book, states that, and I quote, to evoke is to create, to revoke is to forsake. What does it mean? I believe that he was merely saying that evocation, invocation, whatever the term employed, is as creation is to God. Thus, evoke and revoke responsibly. <laughs> the thought was rather humbling as I considered it in the back of that lumbering minivan. Served to settle my nerves somewhat, as did the earnest, if understated, remarks of the driver. Well, we arrived in Fossbridge a little after 2 p.m. I bade farewell to my escort, and absorbed the cool, desolate atmosphere of the empty thoroughfares. The compass in my mind was highly attuned, Diane, and before long, I found myself standing by the derelict property of Mrs. Ferguson, the elderly lady who had answered the call of her dead husband all those years ago, prior to walking out into the bleak and frigid winter night. Standing there, looking due north, I felt the pull of the Blackwood estate, and, squinting, could just about make out a dark patch of forest crowning the top of a coastal summit, and within that shaded woodland, well, that's what the subsequent hike was about to reveal. Thanks, Peter. Yes. I think that'll have to be it for episode five. Not a problem, Diane. I'll just record the outro, Andy. Of course. That's all we have time for today, folks. Once again, you've been listening to The Woodrow Show, with me, your host, Diane Woodrow. Today's guest has been the renowned paranormal investigator, Peter Van Melsen. 
Our conversation regarding the Hamilton horror will continue next Thursday at 8 p.m. In the meantime, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments section. Until next time. Got it, Diane. Super. Let's take five. And I wouldn't mind getting another cup of tea if I could try. Okay, Diane, we are rolling. Thanks, Andy. And they don't mind you smoking in here? Oh, I'm on the herbals, Diane. Oh, tantamount to incense. Fair enough. <laughs> Hello, you're listening to The Woodrow Show. This is your host, Diane Woodrow. Our conversation with renowned PI Peter Van Melsen concludes today, as we learn what it was that allowed him to expose the truth behind the Hamilton horror, the terrible story of a group of hapless teenagers and a remote property on the Yorkshire coast. Once again, I'm speaking with Peter in the quiet solitude of Rosedale Chapel, here in the Hawardian Hills of North Yorkshire. Peter. Yes? So far, we've heard of your exploits in tracking down the someone or something responsible for the mysterious deaths in the Hawardian Hills. Last time, we closed with your return to Fosbridge, the deserted hamlet some several miles south of your ultimate destination, the Blackwood Estate. Ah, yes. From Mrs Ferguson's abandoned house... I set off on a lengthy tramp across the coastal moorland, towards that curious patch of shaded woodland. As I said, it was a cool, calm day, offering nothing whatsoever to suggest an incursion of any kind on the part of the thing that had attempted to put me off on previous occasions. I clutched my cumbersome copy of bold evocations closely, for I was absolutely certain that the grimoire would be my only protection against the forces awaiting me. I hiked for somewhere in the region of an hour, I believe, before I began to perceive a possible ingress into the dark forest. And as I neared that ingress, I quickly surmised that the route had been carved by deer or such like, praying with every portion of my being that the path hadn't been carved by that damnable grinning meatball. <laughs> The light of day was fading fast, and so, as I stepped into the dense forest, I withdrew my trusty pocket torch, certain it would serve me well in the undergrowth. Were there any signs of man-made tracks? Hmm? Footprints? None. Which I have to admit did little to assuage my trepidation. But on I pressed, heedless, determined to reach the hidden house that I was certain would be waiting for me beyond the trees. I consulted my compass regularly, felt as though I'd been walking for hours, when, finally, I noticed a dim light ahead of me. I approached the light cautiously, Diane, mindful of what may or may not be lingering in the gathering darkness. The woods of Great Britain are strange places at the best of times. I've trod many a forest floor— from the expanses of Sherwood to the ancient groves of Galloway, and more than once I have encountered the very definition of high strangeness amongst the trees. But there was something about that coastal patch that filled my heart with stark horror. It was as though a blight had spread from tree to tree, a scourge whose source was undoubtedly to be found at the forest centre. But still I persisted, my iron will overcoming my consternation, until I stood at the edge of a glowing glade, looking out at last upon a familiar sight, the strange house I'd glimpsed in the illusory world under the influence of punk. Wow! My unspoken sentiments were along similar lines at the time, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I hesitated only a moment, and then stepped out into the glade, onto the old stones of what had once been a pathway. And then the strangest thing happened. How can I describe it? Hmm. Well, imagine, if you will, an invisible veil draped over the forest. It plays on your senses, 
stimulates fear, turmoil, trepidation. Well, in stepping into that glade, I felt as though I'd conquered our would-be vampire's final safeguard, an intangible cloud of despair designed to repel me. A moment of triumph, to be sure. But ahead of me stood the old house, Blackwood's manor house, its walls crawling with yellowing ivy, its ancient windows opaque with condensation, its gable roof obscured by moss and mould. Oh, ghastly though the sight was, I wasn't about to allow my revived conviction to go to waste. And so, without hesitation, I approached the tarnished door, pushed it open, stepped inside. Where are you? You can't hide from me in the flesh, Blackwood. Hmm. Blackwood? I know who you are. And through some infernal chemistry, you've managed to survive all these years. Hmm. What does it take to live forever, Blackwood? Show yourself, man. <laughs> Hmm. There's no Blackwood here, Mr. Van Nelson. No? Then who are you? My name is Legacy. Legacy? That's the name I was given. The name you were given? By whom? Mr. Blackwood. <laughs> You're my legacy, he would say. Oh. My legacy. Don't you see, Mr. Van Melsen? I... Well, no, I don't. Who are you, really? I just told you. I'm Legacy. Blackwood's Legacy. What? What? What happened to you? Did Blackwood do that to you? Oh, Blackwood didn't do anything to me, Mr. Van Melsen. Hmm? As a matter of fact, I have Mr. Blackwood to thank for my very existence. But... but you're... you're a... a monster? Yes. <laughs> We're all monsters, I, Mr. Van Melsen. I, stay where you are, Legacy. When Mr. Blackwood passed on, I had little choice but to source my... nutrients elsewhere. Nutrients? The human beings you've preyed upon? Nutrients? Is that how you feel about pork or poultry, Mr. Van Melsen? Well... My needs are the same as yours, huh. except that I don't have a choice. I didn't request this existence. I was the will of another. The result of greed. Of, dare I say it, madness. What? Stay where you are! You believe that it's some physical weakness that has forsaken me all these years. Mm. Some pitiful decrepitude brought on by lack of nourishment. How wrong you are, Mr. Van Melsen. What? It's this inhuman form, this mockery of symmetry that has prevented me from moving amongst the living. Oh, I've ventured out in times of desperation more than once. No. Fared well in Fosbridge. But you know all about that, don't you, Mr. Van Melsen? <laughs> Stay back, I said. I can no longer risk exposure. My home must remain a sanctuary. The humble wander moth has been my only recourse, notwithstanding those occasional side effects. Hallucinations be damned. But... I get what I need, most of the time. <laughs> Imagine their faces, Mr. Van Melsen, your fellow human beings, young and fearful, drawn to my lair to be consumed, torn asunder by these serrated teeth, digested in this cauldron of a belly. Eat well, live forever. That's what Mr. Blackwood used to say. <laughs> You're not afraid, are you? Never. You? A man who has faced a thousand monsters in his time? Back, I yelled. 
and still the creature moved towards me, edging ever closer. And it was salivating Diane, its mouth a poorly fashioned orifice, the scarring of stitching marring it from left to right, oozed a dark substance which dripped onto the polished floor. Ugh, sounds positively repulsive, Peter. It was an abomination, Diane. Gazing at it, I saw the beast of Sutton Bank, coarse fur covering puffy arms, and legs riddled with growths and lumps. As I listened to it, I heard the awful tones of James Barker's laughing man. It was the dreadful amalgamation of all the weird things the boys had glimpsed in the illusory world, the monsters made flesh during Patrick Jones's guided journeys. Whatever form it had taken in the beginning had been lost in the wake of a gradual and shocking metamorphosis. In the end, there was only one way to destroy the thing, and in so doing, I was able to verify that it hadn't ever been a human being. Please elaborate. The thing had me cornered, Diane. So out came Karnaki's book, and my last line of defense, a spray bottle filled to the brim with a solution of jimson-weed-infused punk and tap water. Back, Legacy. Stay back. I would have fed well on the boys. Jones, for sure. But that stuff, that poison they consumed, showed them the way, brought you to my door. Where are you? Where are you? I need my nutrients, Mr. Van Melsen. I must eat. Mm. Haven't eaten for a long time. I must have my nutrients. Oh, oh you'll get your nutrients all right. <coughs> what? What is this? The effects were almost immediate. Coughing and spluttering, the legacy fell victim to a punk-induced phantasmagoria. Its strange body rocked to and fro, as its horribly distorted appendages fought off numerous invisible assailants. Visions of his victims, perhaps? Oh, you mustn't concern yourself with what it saw, Diane. In any case, the spraying of that bottle bought me a few vital seconds. Let me be! Let me be! Let me be! Yes. Okay. <coughs> Coot! Slent! Star! What? Duress! Where? Okay. <coughs> Coot insolent. What? Star in duress. Where? Yes, yes. Mar in fress. Is... Teress in pass. Is that you, Mr. Blackwood? <laughs> Coot insolent. No. Star in duress. No. It wasn't my fault. It was. Oh, yes. Oh. Star. Mar in fress. Tress in pass. Ooh. Oh. What happened to it? It melted, Diane. Melted like gelato on a hot day. Like butter in a microwave. Like... Okay, okay, I get it. <laughs> Excuse me. Just tell me one thing. Fire away. What the heck was it? I mean, you said you were able to verify that it hadn't ever been a human being. Well, what on God's green earth was it? Well, Diane, my instinct saved me on this occasion, I believe. Let me say that if I hadn't consulted my copy of Bold Evocations on the journey over to Fosbridge, I might have been ill-equipped to defend myself. You see, I was convinced that the mastermind in this case had been Thomas Blackwood, who through some diabolical means had managed to live for two centuries by subsisting off the flesh, blood, and bone of unsuspecting victims lured to his isolated house. Yes. And so, with that in mind, I'd consulted Karnaki's book in an effort to understand how such a thing might have been accomplished. In doing so, I stumbled upon something crucial. 
an article concerning the subject of reanimation. I wasn't completely unfamiliar with the method outlined in the book, but I'd never actually heard of such a method being employed. Essentially, it entails the assembly of carefully selected body parts, animal, mineral, you name it. A certain evocation can be utilized to imbue the various parts and pieces with a sort of a rudimentary consciousness. Where this consciousness comes from exactly, well, that's another matter altogether. Nasty business, I know. But Karnaki, bless him, was kind enough to include an incantation he acquired from a sorcerer in Ireland, a spell designed to undo the initial evocation, in effect to dispel the monster's consciousness. This, ultimately, is what reduced the unspeakable thing to a pool of repugnant blubber, with a little help from my punk solution, of course. So Legacy was what? A sort of Frankenstein's monster? <laughs> well, why not? That's as good a comparison as any. Though I must say the human component was severely lacking. After reducing the creature to pulp, what was next on your agenda? Well, naturally, I had a good old-fashioned nosy. Amongst the valuable artefacts, paintings, furniture, etc., I found a number of diaries kept by the late Thomas Blackwood. In them, he described his life and crimes, the nature of his work in exile, his plans for the future, and his legacy. By all accounts, he was a fascinating character— if unfortunately flawed by a tendency to operate outside the confines of the law. And I believe some of those diaries are now in the possession of the British Library. Yeah, so they tell me, Diane. So they tell me. But it's the one in the hands of the North Yorkshire Police I imagine most folks are eager to get their hands on. The so-called Red Book. Of course. Did you learn anything significant from it before handing it over? Only what I needed to learn, Diane, that ultimately Thomas Blackwood was responsible for the deaths and disappearances of many an innocent citizen. That thing he conjured up was intended to provide him with assistance in his latter years, but it seems as though the man died before his time, leaving the thing to live on in his absence. To tell you the truth, I'm reasonably sure the creature was responsible for his death— Listening to Legacy in its death throes, it was lamenting in what it perceived to be the man's presence. You think it killed him? Oh, I, I think it ate him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the rest, as you know, is history. I returned to Rosedale, contacted DCI Brent, and sent him on to the Blackwood estate, advising him to avoid what might appear to be little more than whale blubber in the entrance hall. A press conference was held, connecting the deaths of Grant Smith, James Barker, the missing daughter of Alice Hargreaves, and many others, to the strange being that had occupied the Blackwood estate, the thing that had dwelt there for almost two centuries. It's a truly incredible account, Peter. Yes. Having listened to you describe the events in such minute detail, I find it utterly astonishing that you were able to not only track this creature down, but also that you were able to eliminate it in such an effective manner. I, well, as I often am actually, was very fortunate, Diane. The stars were aligned in my favour. Had I been there without that book? Well, it doesn't bear thinking about. If you hadn't been in possession of that book, would you have stood a chance? Well, it's hard to say. I might have been consumed, added to its body, so to speak, incorporated somehow. Or it might have attempted to take me over, to have me carry out its wicked business in some ghastly capacity. The punk solution might have provided a means of escape, but as I say, it really doesn't bear thinking about. I'm still troubled, Diane. The beast of Sutton Bank, for all intents and purposes, is still out there. If so, then the Laughing Man and the Winged Furball of Wigan are probably out there too. 
But I like to believe that these entities, these hallucinations made flesh, no longer exist, that they simply ceased to be following the deaths of their creators. But one must be rational when it comes to the question of belief. Incidentally, I'm still in touch with Patrick Jones. He tells me he no longer hears laughter throughout the house after dark. The end of the Hamerton horror? All aspects of the thing? Let's hope so. How are we doing, Andy? It's about that time, Diane. Okay, great. Nancy, after we've wrapped, can you start clearing this furniture away? No problem. Well, the clock is ticking and we're rapidly running out of time. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for sharing your extraordinary story with us, Peter. You're welcome. I'm hopeful that your story, and the case in general, will allow for an opening of minds up and down the country. Of course. Let us reconsider the things we take for granted. To remember that the world in which we live is full of marvels and dangers. That nothing is ever quite what it seems. Thank you for the invitation, Diane. It has been a pleasure... Perhaps we can do it again sometime. Certainly, Diane. I've many, many stories to tell. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> yes, I imagine you will, Diane. And that brings us to the end of our conversation with Mr Van Melson. We hope you found the series informative and revelatory. And who knows, perhaps we'll sit down again with Peter in the future. You just named the time and place, Diane. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> It simply remains for me to say that you've been listening to The Woodrow Show with me, your host, Diane Woodrow. Our guest has been the renowned paranormal investigator, Peter Van Melsen. For information regarding future series, be sure to subscribe to our RSS feed. In the meantime, feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section. Until next time. Thank you again, Diane. I'd best be off. I... You have been listening to Hammer and Nails, recorded and produced by Ian and Jennifer Gordon. Starring Ian Gordon as Peter Van Melsen, Leighton Davis, The Laughing Man, Wilfred Anforth. Jennifer Gordon as Diane Woodrow, Scarlet Frequency. Max Rudd as Andy Perkins. Jess Gordon as Nancy Peterson, Oval Jones. Gareth Wynne as Mark Brent, Ben Gordon as Patrick Jones, Gary Gordon as Norman Kane, Jacqueline Callally as Mary O'Brien, Paul Draper as Taxi Driver, and Simon Stanhope as Legacy. Story and ambient music by Ian Gordon. Artwork by Duncan Kay, with supplementary imagery produced via Mid Journey. Title music Van Melsen's theme by David Jeffries. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.